Hi guys, good afternoon. So, uh, ilan na ba tayo? 160. So, we'll just wait for the rest, then we'll start with our HTML rationalization. But ang konti, ang konti pala. Sige, start na tayo. Okay, so this is our HTML rationalization. Okay, so uh, ito po yung mga scores natin for this exam. As you can see, medyo mataas yung average compared to the other exams. Around 34 po ang average. Actually, yung highest natin for this exam, 49. Okay, so may naka 49 po, dalawa actually. Then, we asked you to evaluate kung gaano kahirap yung exam. And karamihan sa magot na 8 over 10 but as you can see uh, very uh, spread yung ano yung grading natin so may mga sumagot na actually yung 3 over 10 so i think medyo madali nga siya compared to the other exams okay let's start so this is the first question is okay, so arrange the following steps in order from the last step to the last step in processing calcified tissue so ang tinatanong dito guys yung proper na sequence ng tissue processing and I hope you have memorized this already. So ang sagot natin dito 3, 4, 1, 5, 2 and 6. So this, these are the steps of tissue processing. So please memorize this in the proper order. Okay? So next tayo. Methods of tissue processing guys. You have two methods of tissue processing. You have manual and automatic tissue processing. So yung manual ito yung usual na ginagawa natin sa laboratory. You do not use any special equipment. Pag sinabi automatic naman, gumagamit tayo ng equipment to automate the process of tissue processing. There are two types actually of automatic tissue processing. You have your tissue transfer and fluid transfer na automatic tissue processing. So, anong difference ng dalawa? So, for your tissue transfer from the name itself, tissue yung tinatransfer natin from each container okay, to different reagents. Pag sinabi yung fluid transfer naman, yung tissue mo will remain in one container only. Ang nagpapalit or ang tinatransfer mo would be the reagents. Okay? So those are the two types of automatic uh, tissue processing. Next question. Small pieces of tissue are placed in solutions of chemicals at preserved by cross-linking proteins and inactivating the grading enzyme. So, what is being defined here would be fixation. So, karamihan, tumama naman. Okay? So, that's fixation. So, when you say fixation, we preserve tissue as near to its original form as possible. Fixation has various functions. Uh, Naka-enumerate na dito, no? So, just go over this one. Uh, yung video na to, guys, by the way, uh, Iyan ako siya. Iwan ako siya sa page. Then, after some time, ililipat ko siya sa YouTube para ma-access ng iba. Since marami tayong text dito that you need to go back to. Okay? So, next question. Cell components such as nucleic acids are readily stained by? So, ang answer dito would be basic dyes. Marami pa rin sumagot ng acidic, no? Tandaan nyo guys, ang principle dito, Parang magnet, opposites attract. Okay? Kapag ang cell component mo, 
nucleic acid, acidic yan. So, ang stain or ang dye na attracted sa kanya dapat basic. Pag acidic na component naman, ayan, uh, kapag acidic components naman in the cell, ang magsistain naman would be the basic dye. Okay, so balik tayo siya guys. So again, pag acidic component, basic dye. Pag basic component, acidic dye. Okay, vice versa. So ayan, cell components such as nucleic acids with a net negative charge stain more readily with basic dyes and are termed basophilic. Whereas kapag cationic, okay, such as proteins, they have an affinity for acidic dyes which are termed acidophilic. And they are termed acidophilic. Next question. For proper fixation, the amount of fixative must be blank times more than the volume of the tissue. So this is a must know. Kailangan kabisado natin to, no? The answer here would be 20 times the volume of the tissue. So karamihan tama naman. So traditionally, ang uh, sinasabi would be 10 to 25 times the volume. However, recently, uh, according to Bruce Gregorius, dapat, to attain your maximum effectiveness of fixation, 20 times the tissue volume yung uh, fixative mo. Okay? So, ganun ang histopat actually. Maraming i-memorize. So, you really have to uh, study your notes repetitively. Lit-ulitin niya, guys. Okay? Memorize ng memorize. So, these are the criteria for a good fixative. I hope you have uh, studied this before. Kung hindi, pakireview na lang. Okay? Next, this is the most common agent in the preparation of frozen sections. So, answer natin dito would be liquid nitrogen. So, why do we do frozen sections? Usually, we do your frozen sections for rapid diagnosis. So, limbawa, may ongoing na procedure yung, uh, may ongoing na surgical procedure. Yung pasyente, uh, binuksan kasi may gustong tanggalin na tumor. Sometimes, before closing the patient, you have to do your biopsy. And this biopsy would be sent for frozen sectioning. Okay? Ang kagandahan doon kasi, mabilisan na babalik agad yung uh, result mo and that would affect yung management ng patient. So, halimbawa, nakita na yung biopsy through for frozen section, uh, malignant. So, mayayari niyan, instead of just removing the tumor, pwede magtanggal ng mga uh, areas na nakapaligid doon sa tumor. Or kung nakita nilang benign man yung tinanggal na biopsy, pwede na isara and ibang ma ibang management ng gagawin sa patient. So, yun yung purpose ng frozen section. It's for rapid diagnosis. You also do it for lipids, nervous tissue, enzymes, uh, processing, fluorescent microscopy, etc. And for special studies. Okay? So, ano ba yung mga ginagamit natin reagent for frozen section? So, these are the reagents. You have four. The most commonly used would be your uh, liquid nitrogen. So, liquid nitrogen is generally used in histochemistry and during operative procedures. Okay? It is the most rapid, actually, of your commonly available freezing agents. Next, ideal fixation temperature for tissues to be examined using an electron microscope. Madaming na huli dito, no? medyo madami yung sumagot ng negative 18. Yung negative 18, guys, yan yung ginagamit na temperature for your cryostat. Okay? Kapag electron microscopy, dapat ang temperature would be 0 to 4 degrees Celsius. So, ito yung statement from Bruce Gregorius. For electron microscopy and some histochemistry, ideal temperature is 0 to 4 degrees Celsius. Okay? Uh, next, all of these factors accelerate fixation except, uh, except, sorry. So, except po cold temperature. All the rest would... Uh, Yung cold temperature, it will not accelerate. All the rest will accelerate fixation. So, ito yung mga factors, no? Which retard or enhance your fixation. Please uh, memorize this one. Uh, important to guys sa boards. Pwede pa more type to actually. Okay? So, fixation is retarded usually if you have a large tissue section. Since kapag mas malaki yung tissue, hindi madaling mag-penetrate yung fixative. Kapag may mucus, this will prevent also the penetration of fixative, fat, blood, and also cold temperature. And again, enhance would be smaller and thinner sections. Pag mas maliit ng section or mas manipis, mas madaling mag-penetrate yung fixative. Agitation will also enhance fixation as well as moderate heat. Okay? But not too much heat. Dapat moderate heat lang. Okay, next. 
this reagent must not be used when handling tissue for glycogen staining. So, dito po, medyo hati yung mga sagot natin. The answer here is simply water. Remember, glycogen is a polysaccharide, which is water-soluble. Okay? Even sa clinical chemistry, alam natin yan. Ang glycogen po, natutunaw siya sa tubig. That's why you do not have an enzyme for digesting glycogen. Hindi nyo na kailangan na enzyme para dyan. Unlike for starch, ang starch kailangan mo na amylase. Okay? It is also a polysaccharide, but it's not water-soluble. Ang glycogen po, water-soluble. So, in tissue processing, if you are looking for glycogen, you have to avoid any reagent with water since this will now cause the removal or the dissolution of your glycogen. Okay? So, ayan. Water should not be used for glycogen-containing tissues. Good example, liver. Okay? Ang liver nyo, may, may glycogen dyan. So, if you're trying to look for glycogen in the liver, you do not use any reagent with water. Okay, next, fastest decalcifying agent. So, ang fastest decalcifying agent would be nitric acid. So, karamihan tama naman dito. Yeah, nitric acid is the most common as well as the fastest decalcifying agent. Commonly, it is used with a concentration of 5 to 10%. So, ito yung mga disadvantage niya. It causes uh, rapid tissue swelling. Okay? Tissue distortion din, damage tissue antigens, and loss of enzymes. So, nitric acid po most commonly used for decalcification. Next, what reagent can dehydrate and clear at the same time? Okay? So, sagot natin dito would be THF, tetrahydrofuran. For the histopath boards, Kailangan i-take note yung mga reagent na ganito na yan. Yung mga double purpose. So, sulat nyo sila sa isang card. Tapos, uh, i-memorize sila. Kasi mahilig na, favorite na tinatanong yan ng mga board examiner. So, dehydrates and clears at the same time. That's tetrahydrofuran. Okay. So, next. Ito yung mga commonly used na dehydrating agents. So, we have your alcohols, which are the most commonly used. Among your alcohols, you have ethyl alcohol, which is recommended for routine dehydration of tissue. And I know most of you na naka-experience ng tissue processing, ethyl alcohol yung gamit. Okay? This is considered to be the best dehydrating agent because it is fast-acting and it is not poisonous unlike the other dehydrating agents. Other alcohols include your methyl alcohol. Of course, we know that methyl alcohol is toxic. Okay. It is primarily used for blood and tissue films and for smear preparation. Ang butyl alcohol naman, uh, very slow siya na dehydrating agent. Tandaan niya guys, ito yung ginagamit for plant and animal microtechnics. Ang palatandaan ko dito, di ba, butyl, butyl, di ba, plant, butyl seed, di ba? So you remember, you associate it with plants, okay? So ginagamit mong butyl alcohol for plant and animal microtechnics. You also have acetone, which is extremely volatile and yung kanyang disadvantage. Aside from that, in, uh, very flammable. Dioxane, si dioxane double purpose. So remember this one, okay? Si dioxane, it is a dehydrating and clearing agent at the same time, okay? Ang palitandaan ko dito para maalala ko na double purpose siya, di ba dioxane? Di means two, okay? So that's dioxane. Uh, cellulosol is your ethylene glycol monoether. It dehydrates rapidly. Then you also have triethyl phosphate and tetrahydrofuran. Again, we have mentioned a while ago, your tetrahydrofuran is double purpose. It is dehydrating and clearing. Please take note of that. Okay, next question. Not a clearing agent. This is what? Acetone. Okay. So let's go over your clearing agents. The most commonly used is silene or silol. This is the most rapid clearing agent. Then you also have toluene, okay, which is uh, which is used as a substitute for silene or benzene. Okay. Benzene penetrates and clears tissues rapidly. However, guys, tandaan nyo, ang problem kay benzene, it is highly toxic. Okay? And at the same time, it is carcinogenic. Ang benzene, it can actually cause uh, a plastic anemia. Okay? Benzene can cause a plastic anemia.
Chloroform. Chloroform is lower in action than silene. It, it can be used for routine cleaning. However, ang problem is toxic din, lang, uh, din siya like your benzene. Okay? Aside from that, please take note, Chloroform does not make tissues transparent. You, uh, may actually, may isa pang question regarding this one. So, tandaan nyo na, si chloroform po, it does not make tissues transparent. Okay. Cedarwood oil is used for your central nervous system or for dense tissues like your uterus. Okay. Aniline oil recommended for embryos, insects, and very delicate specimens. Ang clove oil naman uh, causes minimum shrinkage of tissues, low acting and expensive. Yung mga ganito guys, uh, you have to be uh, smart when it comes to memorizing. Tandaan niyo yung mga uh, hindi niyo kailangan tandaan actually lahat eh. Ang kailangan niyo tandaan yung mga purpose tapos tingin-tingin din kayo ng mga uh, previous questions sa boards, tingnan niyo kanino matinanong na. Kasi most likely yun din yung tatanungin. Okay? Kasi sobrang dami niyan eh. If you're going to memorize everything, hindi kayo matatapos sa pag-aaral. So, study smart. Okay? Yan. Carbon tetrachloride, same as chloroform. The, was, uh, the problem also is highly toxic siya. Then, again, you have here tetrahydrofuran. Again, si THF, it dehydrates and clears at the same time. Take note of the reagents with a double purpose. Then, you also have amyl acetate and terpinol. So, let's just... Skip that part. Carcinogenic clearing agent. So we have mentioned this. This is benzene. Again, your benzene causes a plastic anemia. Bakit tanong din sa hima, di ba? Yan. So benzene can damage the bone marrow, resulting in a plastic anemia. Next, you have here two statements. When a dehydrating agent has been entirely replaced by the solvent, the tissue has a translucent appearance. Second statement, chloroform, a clearing agent, does not make the tissue transparent. So both statements are correct. Okay? So uh, yung first statement actually describes the process of the de, uh, de alcoholization or what we call clearing. So after clearing, your tissue ha usually assumes a translucent appearance. Then yung second statement, ito yung binanggit ko kanina, si chloroform po, it does not make the tissue transparent. Okay, both statements are correct. Next, manual paraffin processing makes use of four changes of wax at 15 minutes interval. So kung na-experience yun manual uh, tissue processing, dapat masasagot nyo to guys. No? So four changes of wax yan. So meaning apat na, para, uh, apat na container ng paraffin wax, then 15 minutes each container. So, total of 60 minutes yan. Ay, yung mga masisipag na interns. Ayan. Maalala niyan guys. Next, paraffin wax substitute correctly matched to its melting point. So, for your paraffin wax substitutes, ang kailangan niyo i-memorize would actually be the melting points. Yan yung paborito ang tinatanong about the paraffin wax substitute. So, ang, inco ang correctly matched dito po si Paraplast. So, ito yung tama na mga melting point for the other substitutes. Please take note of this. So for embedol, 56 to 58. Ester wax, 46 to 48. Carbo wax, 38 to 42. Okay? So these are your paraffin substitute. You have paraplast with a melting point of 56 to 57. Under paraplast, you have your embedol, bioloid, tissue mud. Then ester wax, 46 to 48 degrees Celsius, harder than paraffin, not soluble in water, but soluble in 95% ethyl alcohol and other clearing agents. Then water-soluble waxes, the example here is carbowax, which is the most commonly used water-soluble wax. Okay, next, if wet soloidine method is for bones, teeth, large brain sections, and whole organs, dry soloidine method is for... So, mostly tama. The answer here would be I sections. So, there are two methods of uh, celoidine impregnation. You have your wet celoidine and dry celoidine. So, let's go. Let's discuss that. Okay? So, these are the two methods of celoidine impregnation. Ang difference nila, guys, is kung saan nyo isa-store yung tissue block prior to celoidine impregnation. For wet celoidine, 
you store the tissue block in 70 to 80% alcohol. Whereas in dry celloidine, we store using Gilson's mixture. So take note of the difference. Okay? And of course, different in sila when it comes to the purpose. Ang wet celloidine would be for bones, teeth, large brain sections, and whole organs. Whereas ang dry celloidine would be for whole eye sections. Okay? Next, this is a question about your microtomes. Paborito rin tinatunan ng board exam niya yung mga microtome. So, this was invented in 1881, used for cutting serial sections of large blocks of paraffin embedded tissue. So, this is your rocking microtome. Now, you have here a table showing you the various types of your microtomes. Then, yung inventor nila, guys, you have to memorize this one. Okay? Paborito ang tinatanong ng board examiner. Then, of course, yung use. Okay? Para saan sila? Is it for paraffin blocks or celloidine blocks, etc.? Uh, then, yung remarks dito. Okay? So, just go over this one. Microtomes. Next, water bath used for flotation is set at Okay, so karamihan tama din, 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. Now, bakit 45 to 50? Remember, yung water bath nyo, dyan nyo nilalagay yung mga nakat na na ribbons ng tissue. So, yung mga yun, ayaw natin na mag-melt, of course, yung paraffin. So, kailangan yung temperature setting ng water bath would be lower than the uh, melting point of paraffin. So, 45 to 50 degrees Celsius yun. Approximately 6 to 10 degrees Celsius lower. Okay, than the melting point of the wax used for embedding the tissue. So, yun, lower dapat siya by 6 to 10, or around 45 to 50. Next question. The following faults are correctly matched to the cause, except, so that the correct answer would be air holes. So, ano ba yung commonly nagkakos ng air hole? Commonly, ang, hair, ang air hole po, okay, is usually due to incomplete impregnation. Okay, so, tandaan nyo lang din yung mga ibang choices. Ang milky clearing agent, this is usually due to incomplete dehydration. Okay? Kapag yung tissue mo, may counting water pa rin dyan, tapos nilagay mo sa silin, makita mo talaga na naging milky ang silin. Okay? Tissue is opaque, usually this is due to insufficient clearing. Crystalline wax, the block na was not rapidly cooled, and so on. Okay? So, memorize this. Used for localization of vaginal adenosis. So you have here the various types of uh, specimen collection uh, in your cytology. So bawat method, bawat, yung, bawat type ng scraping may, isang, uh, may katumbas na purpose. Ang vaginal scrape nyo, so isa-isay natin, vaginal scrape is for hysterectomy, lateral vaginal scrape, magkaiba po yan. No? Ang lateral vaginal scrape is for hormonal evaluation, for quadrant, vaginal scrape is for localization of vaginal adenosis. So, yun yung tama sagot. Yan. Then, vulvar scrape is for the detection of herpetic lesions or carcinoma. Okay? So, magkakiba yung purpose nila. You have to memorize that also. Next, another recall question. Most commonly used enzyme for label labeling in immunohistochemistry. So, this is your horseradish peroxidase. Okay? Related question, ito, combining horseradish peroxidase with DAB, DAB, what's DAB? DAB is diamino, uh, diamino benzidine. Yun yung most common reagent din, guys, or substrate. Results in an end product with a dark brown color. So, ito, another recall question regarding immunohistochemistry. Ano yung most common na chromogen? So, a most common enzyme horseradish peroxidase. A most common na uh, chromogen or substrate would be diaminobenzidine. Ang positive result nila, madali ring tandaan, dark brown. Diba? DAB. O, oh, medyo close na sa dark brown. Epithelial tumor marker found in colon cancer. So, ayan po. Ang sagot dito would be CK20. So, you have here two types of cytokeratin. Actually, madami ito, no? pero ito lang lang yung finocus natin. You have CK7 and CK20. Ang CK7, usually makita yan sa lung, breast, uterus, and ovarian tumors. CK20 naman, colon and stomach. So, usually, kapag positive sa CK7, negative naman sa CK20, and vice versa. 
Okay, so tandaan nyo lang guys, sino yung positive sa CK7, sino yung positive sa CK20. Next, staining method of choice for exfoliative cytology. So karamihan tama, this is your pap smear. Okay? So yan, originally it was indicated for vaginal smears to detect human uterine or cervical cancers, but pap smear has now been used for evaluation of practically all types of specimen received in cytology. So hindi lang po siya pang uh, tawag dito, pang uh, vaginal na swab or whatever. Basta kahit ano specimen for cytology, kamuli ginagamit na rin yung pap stain or pap smear. Next, the, these questions are now part of your general pathology. Okay? So usually, uh, may mga questions tayo sa boards about gen path. Pero there's no... Uh, Tawag dito? Hindi na makailangan na aralin po yung general pathology. Yung mga most commonly lang na tinatanong na topics. Kasi ang gen path by itself is a one whole subject. And it is really hard for us to uh, study this. Kasi... Hindi naman siya ganun kadami rin na question sa board. So, study smart again. Piliin nyo yung mga topics na usually tinatanong about gen path. Okay? So, yung mga questions dito, yan yung mga commonly na tinatanong about gen path sa boards. So, the term that best describes nuclear fragmentation would be what? Carrier, carrier hexis. Okay? So, ano ba yan? Yung carrier hexis as well as pyknosis and cariolysis these are the nuclear changes we see in necrosis. Now remember, there are two types of cell death. And two types of cell death would be apoptosis and necrosis. Apoptosis would be your programmed cell death. Necrosis is your pathological na death, na cell death. Now, there are morphologic changes in the cell which we can observe to see kung apoptosis ba yun or necrosis. Sa nucleus, meron tayong tatlong changes na hinahanap which points out to necrosis. So, this would be pyknosis, carrier hexis, and cariolysis. Magkakaiba po yan. Okay? Tandaan niyo yung definition ng bawat isa. Okay? So, ito mas magandang illustration. Pag sinabing pyknosis, that's nuclear shrinkage. Lumit yung nucleus. Carrier hexis is nuclear fragmentation. Cariolysis naman is nuclear fading. Okay? So, lahat sila, they are signs of uh, necrosis. Next, which of the following organisms is most commonly associated with Cassius necrosis? So, of course, this is mycobacteria. Usually, ang Cassius necrosis found in the lungs okay, uh, of patients with pulmonary tuberculosis. And we know that your tuberculosis is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, let's discuss the various morphological patterns of necrosis. Okay? Now, yung necrosis, we know that that's your pathological cell death. Pag tinignan mo siya sa tissue level, meron iba't ibang types yan when it comes to morphology. So, anim yun. Ano ba yung anim na morphologic patterns na yan? You have your coagulation necrosis. When you say coagulation necrosis, this is a type of necrosis usually caused by uh, ischemia. Okay? Na-deprive yung tissue by, na-deprive yung tissue ng oxygen. Okay? Yun yung nag-trigger ng coagulation necrosis. Now, usually, Makikita natin ang coagulation necrosis sa kidney, heart, and adrenal glands. Best example dito, and usually na ginagamit na example sa boards, would be myocardial infarction. Okay? So sa puso, coagulation necrosis. Ang liquefaction necrosis naman, this is characterized by digestion of dead cells to form a viscous liquid mass. Kaya nga tinawag siya ng liquefaction Okay, or liquefactive necrosis. Usually, we see this in the brain, okay? particularly in patients na, na stroke. Okay? So, that's liquefactive necrosis. So, sa puso, coagulation necrosis. Sa brain, liquefactive. Fat necrosis, on the other hand, uh, usually associated to sa pancreas. Okay? Like, for example, acute pancreatitis. In acute pancreatitis, the destruction of the pancreas causes the release of lipase. Okay? Yung lipase, kakalat siya dun sa paligid na tissue, okay? paligid na adipose tissue, and it will cause the necrosis of your adipose tissue. So that's fat necrosis. Cassius necrosis, again, usually found sa lungs, okay? in, uh, in particular, pulmonary tuberculosis. This is a combination of coagulative and liquefactive necrosis. 
Gangrenous necrosis is a type of coagulative necrosis. This is uh, caused by ischemia sa mga limbs. Okay? Kapag ang gangrenous necrosis, may superimposed na infection, you call that wet gangrene. Okay? So, may, may tinatawag tayong dry gangrene at wet gangrene. Pag sinabing dry gangrene, yun yung gangrene na caused lang by ischemia. Wala kang infection na superimposed. Pag sinabing wet gangrene, meron kang superimposed na infection. Of course, mas mabaho yung wet gangrene. Okay? Good example yung mga patients na may diabetes. Kapag malala na yung diabetes, eventually yung limbs nila nagkakaroon ng ischemia. Then, magda-die off yung limb, yung part ng limb because of ischemia. Okay? That leads to necrosis. Kapag may infection, na-infect yung area na yun, it becomes sweat gangrene. Fibrinoid necrosis is a special form of necrosis, usually yung affected dito blood vessels. And you have the deposition of immune complexes. Next question, most common type of necrosis caused by irreversible focal injury, mostly from sudden cessation of blood flow and less often from bacterial and chemical agents. So we have discussed this already. Pag nakita niyan, cessation of blood flow, that's your coagulative necrosis. Again, best example, myocardial infarction. Next, a term describing an increase in cell size. This is your hypertrophy. Okay. Ang hyperplasia, remember, this is cost or this uh, this is an increase in cell number. Magpagbabalik ta rin. Hypertrophy, size. Hyperplasia, number. So ito po yung hyperplasia at hypertrophy, these are alterations in your cell growth, okay? They are cellular adaptations to injury. Ang alterations sa cell growth, it could be classified as retrogressive. Uh, progressive or degenerative. Under retrogressive, you have the following. You have aplasia, which means an incomplete or defective development of a tissue or organ. Ang agenesia naman, complete non-appearance of an organ. So, totally hindi nagpakita yung organ. Hindi, maski yung precursor ng organ, yung primitive na precursor ng organ, hindi nag-appear. That's agenesia. Pag sinabing hypoplasia naman, nag-develop yung organ, pero kulang. Okay? So, there, this is a failure of an organ to reach or achieve its full mature adult size. Yun ang difference ng agenesia at hypoplasia. Okay? Atresia is a failure of an organ to form an, an opening. Like for example, uh, anal atresia or vaginal atresia. Okay? Uh, pinanganak, tas walang butas. That's atresia. Atrophy, on the other hand, is a decrease in cell size or decrease in the total number of cells. So, nangyari, nag-develop yung organ to its mature state, pero lumit yung organ or yung tissue kasi either nabawasan yung size mo or yung number. So, that's atrophy. Progressive changes, uh, this causes an increase in the size of the organ or tissue. So, again, may dalawang types. You have hypertrophy and hyperplasia. You also have degenerative changes. So, degenerative changes include metaplasia. Pag sinabing metaplasia, you have a change from one cell type to another adult cell type. Okay? Like for example, sa lungs ng smokers. Okay? So, alam natin na ang respiratory epithelium nyo guys, ang composition niya would be pseudostratified uh, epithelium. Okay? Pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. Yun ang lining ng lungs. Okay? Commonly. Now, kapag smoker ang isang pasyente, there's chronic inflammation in the lining of the lungs, then yung lining nung uh, lungs nag-change from pseudostratified ciliated epithelium to stratified squamous. So you have a change from one cell type to another cell type. That's what we call metaplasia. Okay? Dysplasia is regressive alteration in adult cells or simply you have an abnormality in the growth of the tissue. Okay? Ang anaplasia naman, regressive change from an adult cell type to a more primitive. Okay? Now, ang dysplasia at uh, anaplasia, they're not necessarily neoplasia. Hindi sila cancer. Okay? But, both of them can eventually lead to neoplasia. So, yung say neoplasia, you have an autonomous and controlled growth of new cells. Okay? Continuously proliferating without any cause or purpose. That's neoplasia. So next, a form of pathologic atrophy illustrated by wasting of muscles of a limb 
immobilized in a cast. So, this is obviously disuse atrophy. Okay? Kapag ang isang organ or isang tissue hindi mo ginamit for a long time, the tendency is uh, for it to undergo atrophy. Magde-decrease sa size. Okay? That's what we call disuse atrophy. Pag sinabi mong starvation atrophy, yung tissue more organ na deprived ng nutrients. So, eventually, lumiliit siya. Okay? Ischemic atrophy, pag na-deprive naman ng oxygen. Pag pressure atrophy, kapag constantly uh, may pressure dun sa organ. Halimbawa, yung mga uh, patients na bedridden. Okay? Nakahiga lang yan. There's pressure dun sa kanilang uh, skin na uh, dependent or nakadikit dun sa bed. Okay? So, that, uh, that can cause pressure atrophy. Or worse, it can actually cause... Uh, yung tinatawag nating bed sores. That's a form of necrosis na actually. Okay? Or idiopathic atrophy. Atrophy without uh, any cause identified. So, that uh, disuse atrophy involves prolonged diminished functional activity. Hindi nagagamit. Okay? Next, it is defined as the reversible change of one cell type to another. Again, this is metaplasia. Our example would be your smoker's lung. Okay, so let's go to medical technology loss. Okay, medtech loss na tayo guys. Medyo uh, mas mabilis tayo ngayon. No? Okay, so the question here is, the following are functions of the Council of Medtech. More type, no? So one, formulate refresher course. Two, recommend minimum required curriculum. Three, accredit training laboratories. Four, approve medical technology schools. So ang functions ng COMT or Council of Medtech would include one, 2, and 4. Hindi po kasama yung 3 which is to accredit training laboratories. Sino ba yung nag accredit Ang nag accredit would be your yan, CHED. Okay? Through the Bureau of Health Facilities and Services. Okay? So this is CHED Memo number 6 series of 2008 or the guidelines for the accreditation of clinical laboratories involved in the training of medical laboratory science or medtech interns. Okay? So, all tertiary clinical laboratories, yan. Sinabi dito, kailangan tertiary clinical laboratory ka. Licensed by the DOH through the BHFS, okay, can apply for accre accreditation with CHED. So, ultimately, it is CHED which will accredit if a clinical laboratory can uh, serve your internship program or internship training. Okay? Ang COMT nyo, ito yung functions. So, more on the side of education siya. Uh, recommendation ng minimum required curriculum. Yan, determine and prescribe the number of students to be allowed to take up the medtech course in each school. Yan, approve medtech schools, meeting requirements, and require all medtech schools to submit an annual report, etc. Inspect when necessary the different medtech schools. So, sometimes may mga umiikot na sa mga iba't ibang medtech schools uh, to see kung yung school na yun nagpo-follow na requirements. That's usually your Council of MedTech. Uh, to certify for admission into an undergraduate internship student, yung COMT yan, okay, formulate and recommend approval of refresher course. Ito guys, very important. No? Yung refresher course, COMT po ang nag approve yan. Ang isang question about your refresher course is that kailan ba nagre-refresher course ang isang, ang isang taker? Okay? Ang refresher course, nire-require yan after the third take. So, nakatatlo ka ng boards, hindi ka uh, pinalad, ganyan. Uh, you have to take the refresher course. And yung refresher course na take mo dapat should be approved by the COMT. Hindi lang po basta-basta uh, nag-offer ng refresher course sa mga school. Okay? Or actually even sometimes uh, nako-confuse ng mga students yung review sa refresher course. May mga nagtatanaw sa amin na pwede ba mag-enroll sa review as their refresher course. Hindi po pwede yun, okay? Kailangan, school yan, accredited by the COMT to provide the refresher course. Okay? So again, you have to take the refresher course after the third time. So yan, go over the functions of the COMT. Yan, mem uh, term of office for the members of the Board of MedTech. This would be 3 years. Okay? However, hindi po ito nasusunod masyado sa atin. Kasi minsan, uh, walang papalit on sa board. Okay? Uh, nandiyan ba si Sir Mark? Nandiyan na si Sir Mark pala. And si Sir Mark, ang pangarap maging board of 
Mentec. Hindi ko alam kung susunod siya sa 3 years. Diba? Hi, sir. And so, your board of examiners would be comprised of a chairman who should be a pathologist appointed by the President of the Philippines. So, nag appoint guys, President of the Philippines. Another board question. Aside from the chairman, you have two members who should be registered mentex, again appointed by the President of the Philippines, and each of these members serve a term of three years dapat. Okay, this is according to RA 5527, Section 7. Next, the following subjects have a relative weight of 20% in the boards, except, I hope, kabisado nyo na to guys, kasi uh, magtitake kayo ng boards, no? Ang mga 20% would of course be your major subjects. That would include clinical chemistry, micro para, ISBB, and hematology. So lahat ng major 20%. Ang CM at histopat, parehong tag 10% yan. Okay? Yung mga minor, 10% sila. Now, how do you compute for your general weighted average? Yung mga scores na makukuha nyo for each of the six subjects in the boards, multiply by their weight, tapos i-add lahat yan. Okay? So, yung mga major subjects nyo, since 20% sila, twice yung bearing nila versus the other minor. Okay? Kasi tag 10% lang yung CM at saka histopat. So, ayan. Although sa boards, kahit na minor yung CM at histopat, hindi nyo sila dapat baliwalain. Okay? Kasi actually, mas mahirap nga sila eh, minsan compared sa major. And yung mga yan, kung bumagsak kayo dyan, pwede mahila din yung G1 nyo. Yan pa yung ikokos ng uh, mag-fail kayo. Okay? So huwag nyo silang babaliwalain. Actually, ang lowest ko sa boards is topat eh. Hindi ko alam bakit ako nagrarasyo ngayon. De joke. Uh, Yan, lowest kong histopat. Pero, of course, yun, hindi ko naman siya binaliwala. Nag-aral pa rin ako ng histopat. Yun lang talaga, may mga questions minsan sa histopat na hindi mo alam saan galing. How many signatures are found in the COR or Certificate of Registration? So, marami nagkamali dito, guys. Ang sagot ng karamihan, 3. Okay, this should be 4. Bakit apat? Kasi, again, you have three members of the board, the chairman and the two members, so tatlo. Then you have the PRC chairman, kaya apat. Okay, huwag niyo kakalimutan yan kung gusto niyo magka-COR. Mobile lab is allowed to operate within a blank radius from the main laboratory. So this should be 100 kilometers. So this would be found in RA 4688 or the Clinical Laboratory Act of 1966. Yan. So next question. This question is about newborn screening. So with the exemption of newborns admitted in the NICU, newborn screening should be performed blank hours after birth to within blank days. So this should be 24 hours after birth to within 3 days. Hindi pwedeng maaga masyado. Okay? Hindi, pagka, hindi pwedeng pagkapanganak maging newborn screening ka because this could, this could cause false negatives. Remember, sa newborn screening, ang detect natin most of the time would be the accumulated metabolites due to the inborn error of metabolism. So, you have to give it some time para mag-accumulate yung metabolite na yun para madetect mo siya. Otherwise, you risk having a false negative. Two within blank days, so three days. Hindi pwedeng sobrang tagal din. Kasi, kailangan mahuli agad yung mga inborn errors na yan, then magawa ng uh, intervention. Kasi kung hindi niya sila mahuli agad, pwede mag-suffer yung newborn. Okay? Like for example, in phenylketonuria, one of your uh, inborn errors. Okay? Sa phenylketonuria, pag hindi mo nahuli yan, tapos binigyan mo ng uh, pagkain yung bata na bawal sa kanya, pwede siya magkaroon ng mental retardation. So, kailangan mahuli siya agad. So, this is found in RA 9288 or the Newborn Screening Act of 2004. Now, may isang ano dito, exemption. Should the newborn be admitted in the NICU, it can be performed within 7 days. Okay? So, yun yung exemption. Kung nasa NICU siya, hindi nyo kailangan sundin yung within 3 days. Pwede pa siya within 7 days. Okay? Next, latest adme uh, ad uh, amendment to PD223. So, ano ba tong PD223 na to? Okay. Ang latest amendment dito is RA 8981 or 
your PRC Modernization Act of 2000. So, ang PD-223, ang purpose niya was to create the PRC. Okay? So, yung PD na yan, Presidential Decree ang ibig sabihin. Uh, trivia lang, no? Bakit yan PD? Di ba? Ang mga RA nyo, batas yan. Yan, Congress na nagpas, Senate. Ito, bakit PD to? Itong PD-223 kasi, at saka PD-657, Uh, panahon ni, panahon ni uh, Marcos to. So, martial law yan. Yung mga batas nun, remember, hindi na true Congress dumadaan or napapasa. It's through the executive branch. Kaya naging presidential decree. Okay? So, si President Marcos ang responsible for the creation of your PRC. Okay? Then, eventually, na-amend yan by RA 8981 or the PRC Modernization Act of 2000. Next. He professionalized the medtech course. This is uh, Mr. Nardito Moraleta. So, ano bang ginawa ni Nardito Moraleta? Si Nardito Moraleta ang nag-professionalize ng medtech course by working on the approval of your RA-5527. Okay? In 1969. Next, failure to dispose HIV-contaminated blood. entails imprisonment of 10 years. Okay? So, sa natin makikita to, you will find this in your National Blood Services Act of 1994 or your RA-7719. So, sabi dito sa RA-7719, within 48 hours, and within 48 hours, blood which have been proven contaminated with blood transfusion, transmissible diseases like HIV, uh, kailangan matapon na. Okay? Kailangan ma-dispose na within 48 hours. Otherwise, you will be imprisoned for 10 years. Sino ba yung makukulong dyan? Head ng blood bank, tsaka yung necessary trained personnel under the head. Okay? Found responsible for dispensing, transfusing, and failing to dispose within 48 hours. Yung contaminated na sample. Next, agency who enforces RA 6969. So parang joke lang, no? Pero may ganyan talagang batas, guys. Okay? So, ano ba yung RA-6969? That's your Toxic Substances, Hazardous Wastes, and Nuclear Waste Control Act of 1990. So, ang responsible dito, okay, ang nag enforce nito would be your DNR as well as your PNRA, PNRI, rather, Philippine Nuclear Research Institute. So, may recall question dito. Ang tanong was, ano yung, sino daw yung agency na responsible for disposing your radiologic wastes. So, that's your PNRI. Okay? Mandated by RA-6969. Okay? Samples for confirmation of the SARS-CoV-2 are sent to. So, very uh, timely na question. Of course, this is the RITM. May mga sumagot pa rin ng SACL. Ang SACL more of HIV, guys. Ha? So, RITM, National Reference Lab for Micro and Para. So, dyan din nagpupunta ngayon yung mga specimens natin na for confirmation. Although, of course, you have your uh, laboratories sa regions. Like here in Baguio, you have your uh, Baguio General Hospital. Nagtetest na rin sila. No need to send us RITM. So, ito. This is about your code of ethics. Uh, you have to memorize or at least be familiar with your co code of ethics kasi may mga questions dyan sa boards na fill in the blank. Okay? Lagi kong advice sa students, i-print yung code of ethics tapos ipaskill nyo sa uh, pader. Okay? Tapos dandaanan nyo, uh, basahin nyo lagi, and so on. Okay? And even sa professional work nyo, you really need to Uh, remember your code of ethics. Okay? Marami tayong mga kasama sa profession na minsan, they forget kung ano nasa code of ethics. So, I hope pag naging board passer na kayo, uh, pag nag-take na kayong boards this August, tapos pumasa kayo, you still remember your code of ethics. And you live by it. Okay? Hindi lang siya minememorize. Kailangan uh, pinapatupad siya. Okay? It becomes part of your life. So, ang sagot dito, I shall accept employment for more than one employer only when there is no conflict of interest. Okay, so, ano bang ibig sabihin ng conflict of interest? When you say conflict of interest, you have two employers na yung uh, business interest nila affected by your action, two or more. Okay? So, like for example, you're applying for a laboratory. May shift ka na binigay dun sa laboratory na yon 
tas nag-apply ka for a second laboratory tapos yung shift ng dalawang yung shift mo sa pangalawang laboratory uh, na superimposed dun sa una so there's conflict kasi yung second na employer mo dehado so that's what we call conflict of interest or even kahit na hindi uh, nag superimpose yung mga shift talbawa may shift ka na 5 to 8 tapos nag-apply ka sa second laboratory ng 8 to, let's say, 5 in the morning. So, since sobrang lapit nun, mahirapan ka mag-travel to the second laboratory. Okay? So, magkakaroon din ng conflict of interest kasi maging dehada yung second mo na employer. Okay? So, you have to avoid this. Kung, mag, kung kailangan mo ng dalawang trabaho or tatlo or apat, whatever, ang mahalaga dyan, hindi compromise yung work mo in another uh, employer. Okay? Actually, kapag nag-work ka more than three, more than four na mga uh, employers, ganyan, there's already conflict of interest kasi yung energy mo, share. Okay? Unless you work for various days, okay? In different days for different employers. So, keep this in mind pag nag-work na kayo. Okay? I shall treat any information I acquired about individuals in the course of my work as... Ayan, so, uh, marami naman tama dito Strictly confidential And may be divulged only to authorized persons So tingnan natin, saan ba nag sumagot yung iba? So yung iba, ang sagot nila Strictly confidential And cannot be divulged to anyone So yung confidentiality ng information Ng patient information It is not absolute Okay? Hindi po kasi sinabing strictly confidential uh, Walang instance na pwede mo siyang i-share Okay, may mga instances na prescribed by the law that you can divulge this information. Like for example, may information na directly tied to criminal activity or may information about public health na kailangan mo i-divulge. Okay? So, halimbawa, meron kang HIV patient na uh, voluntarily sinispread niya yung sakit niya. Okay? You have to divulge that information because it threatens public health. Okay? So, may mga instances na pwede i-divulge. Of course, you have to divulge it to the authorized persons or entity. Okay? Or halimbawa, uh, minor. Yung minor uh, may sakit na, well, like, let's say says, uh, STI, sexually transmitted infection, yung minor. Of course, that could be a possible sign of a criminal case. So, you have to divulge that to the proper authority. Okay? So, ang tama sagot dito, letter B. Okay, may be divulged only to authorized persons or entities or with consent of the individual when necessary. Ito yung hindi naiintindihan, of course, ng mga ibang uh, laymen na hindi part ng healthcare profession. No? Like yung sa COVID ngayon. Ang gusto nila, uh, pag COVID patient, idadivulge sa public yung information. Of course, hindi pwedeng ganun basta-basta. Okay? Uh, it will, kung isa-share natin lahat yung information ng patient kasi, it could be a threat to the life of the patient. Like, in one instance, you have a patient na nalaman nung barangay na COVID positive, pinagbabato yung bahay. Okay? So, it becomes detrimental to your patient. So, kailangan ingat talaga tayo sa information. Of course, kapag nag-consent yung patient, well, pwede na i-share. Last sentence, in the panunumpa ng professional. So, this is, kasihan, nawa ako ng Diyos. So, ito yung mga question na, ano ba, kailangan nyo lang talaga i-memorize. Yan. You have here the panunumpa ng professional from your PRC. Okay. So, memorize this one or at least be familiar. Ang isa pang tinatanong dito, guys, ito. Yan, yung ako si blank ng blank. So, this is pook na sinilangan, bayan, lunsod, probinsya. Okay. So, pook. Tapos ang isang paborito tinatanong ito, yung last. Kasihan, nawa ako ng Diyos. Kasihan talaga siya, guys. Hindi siya kasihan. Sinek ko rin kanina. Kasi nakoconfuse ako dyan. It's really kasihan, nawa ako ng Diyos. Hindi siya kasihan, nawa ako ng may kapal. Kasihan, nawa ako ni Batala and so on. It's really kasihan, nawa ako ng Diyos. Okay? Next, during bloodletting, there should be at least, so, dal dapat dalawang blood bank staff. Okay? However, hindi rin nasusunod to. Minsan, isang staff lang. Minsan, isang staff, maraming patients. 
Dap, uh, mali po yan guys no? lalo na pagka meron kang transfusion reaction or sorry, meron kang adverse reaction ba, nahimata yung pasyente of course kung isa lang yung staff or yung staff nagsashare in uh, marami patients na inahawakan, mahirapan na i-manage yung uh, yung adverse reaction so yan, during donor extraction there should be at least two blood bank staff okay, next four essential functions of the manager This is about lab management already. So, the four essential functions of the manager would be your PDOC: planning, directing, organizing, and controlling. So, ito po yon: planning, organizing, directing, and controlling. Okay. So, tanda niyo lang yan. When you say planning, of course, you think about the goals, the objectives of your organization. Pag sinabing organizing, you bring together your resources to achieve your goals. Directing would be uh, ano ba to? Uh, kumbaga pinupush mo yung resources na yan para eventually they could be used to attain the goals. Ang controlling naman would be measurement ng accomplishment ng uh, organization towards the goals that you have set in planning. So lahat ng mga uh, functions na ng management they all work hand in hand. Ito, POCT. So, POCT refers to, when you say POCT, this is point of care testing. POCT refers to any cl uh, clinical lab testing done on the patient's bedside. Okay? So, yan. POCT saves time and is invaluable for patient care. When a device is used at the bedside, it is considered a POCT instrument found in her. Now, in Henry's 23rd, ito yung definition ng POCT. POCT is a laboratory testing that is performed outside the central or core laboratory. So, outside dapat ng laboratory yan. And commonly, sa site of care or close to the patient. Or tulad nga sabi kay Har, bedside. Ang isang question sa boards would be, sino yung nagpa-perform ng POCT? So, in most settings, your POCT is performed by clinical staff. Like for example, nurses rather than laboratorian. So halimbawa, yung mga nurse na nagpa-perform ng uh, blood glucose na capillary, that's considered POCT. Okay? Because it is done in bedside and it is done by clinical staff. Now take note of this statement. Some POCT is also performed by the patient at home. Okay? So even the patient uh, can also perform POCT. Uh, so previous board exams kasi pina more type yan so which of the following can perform POCT you have your doctor nurse medtech and uh, patient so of course kasama yung doctor pwede nurse kasama yung medtech kung wala siya sa laboratory siya yung nag blood glucose sa bedside that's considered POCT yung patient pwede na rin magperform ng POCT so all of the above yan Okay, next, a patient refuses to have his blood drawn for a routine laboratory test request made by his physician. What is the most appropriate course of action? So, may mga questions na ganito sa HTML e na exam. Uh, situational, then tatanayin ka anong gagawin nyo in these uh, situations. So, kapag ganyan, nag-refuse yung patient, anong gagawin nyo? Of course, you do not attempt venipuncture. Kasi kung nag-attempt ka, that would be considered already assault. Okay? Hindi siya tama. Okay, do not attempt. But, of course, you have to document the incident. You have to file an incident report with the laboratory manager. Para pag binalikan ka ng patient, tapos sinabi niya na, uy, hindi, hindi ako nag-refuse ha. Meron kang document na ilalaban. Okay, so mahalaga lagi dyan, documentation. And of course, you have to respect the consent of the patient. Ayan. Patients have the right to refuse treatment even if they signed a document upon admission giving consent. That's actually for every procedure. Every time na mag-collect kayo ng blood, kahit na nakuha na muna siya ng blood before, you ask for consent. Okay? The issue of informed consent is a legal one and the laboratory personnel should act in accordance with laws governing their jurisdiction. Yan. So dito sa exam nyo, siguro may mga nagulat, no? biglang may Westgard rules na tinatanong. Uh, yung Westgard rules kasi part na laboratory management yan and quality control. Sa, kaya sinama ko siya. Although of course sa boards, wala kayong makita na ganitong mga drawing. Puro text lang talaga sa boards. So ang tanong dito, what Westgard rule was violated? So you have here, yan, a single 
data point exceeding your minus 3 SD as pointed by the blue arrow. This is a violation of your 1, 3S. Okay? So please review your Wesseguard rules. Tandaan nyo kung ano yung definition nila. Like for example, 1, 3S is uh, a data point exceeding your plus or minus 3 SD. Ang 2, 2S naman, you have 2 consecutive data points na consecutively exceeding the same side at of uh, exceeding plus minus 2 SD at the same side. 10x naman, text, uh, 10 data points in one side of the mean. For 1s, 4 consecutive values na exceeding the same side of your 1s. Okay? So, tandaan yun. We also have to remember kung sino sa kanila yung nagde-detect ng random at system, uh, systematic error. Ang mga random errors yun, nagsistart sa uh, add number. Okay? Like for example, yung uh, 1, 3s. So, add number yan. Systematic errors naman start sa even. Like itong tatlo. 2-2-S, 10-X, 4-1-S. These are systematic. Tama ba? Or baliktad? Even, systematic, add, uh, random. So, ayan. And this is the last question. Small spill of blood has occurred that involves broken glass. Into which type of container should this be disposed? So, maraming sumagot dito ng Sharps container, which is correct. Pero meron din mga sumagot ng biohazard. Okay. Uh, siguro nalito lang yung iba. Uh, remember, this is broken glass. No? So, considered na sharp yan. So, priority mo yung physical na hazard dito. So, you have to contain your broken glass in a sharps container. Then, since meron kang uh, blood dun sa broken glass, you have to label na biohazard din yung laman no sharps container. So, that's how you do it. Okay? So, that's the last question for his stupat. Yan. So, I hope you have learned something from this. This is actually the last rationalization for this uh, online tagisan series. Uh, we'll be releasing the top 10 later for his to pat. Then, in the coming days, we will release the top 10 overall. And of course, yung winner natin will uh, win a full scholarship in the program na pinili niya. So, kalbawa, ASCP na program yan, you get the full scholarship. Okay? So, good luck dun sa mga nakatapos ng tao dito anim na exams no in your online tagisan. I think mga 200 din yung naka-complete nung anim na exams. Okay? And uh, by the way, this is the first rationalization din na meron tayong share screen tapos nandiyan yung mukha ko. <laughs> okay? So I hope you have enjoyed this uh, series of online exams. Uh, we will not stop here. We will still guide you in your preparation for the boards. So, of course, you have to do your part. Kailangan tuloy-tuloy pa rin yung pagbabasa ninyo. Uh, kahit nasa bahay kayo, buksan nyo pa rin yung notes nyo, buksan nyo pa rin yung books ninyo. Okay? Huwag tayong magpapakampante. Uh, we, do, uh, we still do not know what will happen to the March boards. Some say na sasabay na siya sa August. In that case, of course, you have to be prepared. Okay? Yung mga nag for March, kailangan prepared pa rin kayo. I know medyo nakaka... Tawag doon? pagod na mag-aral na mag-aral but of course you have to do it for your uh, license okay kahit na hindi tayo sure kailan tayo mag -e exam of course you have to assume yung worst okay mali nyo biglang next month diba bigla kayong pag boards o paano yun of course kailangan magbasa pa rin kayo ng basa okay, magbasa pa rin kayo na magbasa okay so thank you if you have questions just uh, message me or si sir mark yan uh, of course lagi na sa facebook eh, pwede yung tanongin if you have questions uh, if you have suggestions, open din din sa suggestions. Okay? So, yun lang. Thank you guys for coming to this uh, histopath rationalization. Again, uh, we will, I will leave this video muna for, I think, 24 hours sa uh, Facebook group. Tapos, ililipat ko sa YouTube para ma-view nung iba. Okay? So, thank you.